Um, many of you recognize that painting. That would be Whistler's mother. <laughs> yes. Well, you might think that Anne was pleased with the way things were going because the recognition was really picking up, but unfortunately, it became a rather commercialized holiday. And the greeting cards began pouring out and the flower uh, companies began selling flowers and the candy companies began selling candy and it was just, it turned into this massive money-making scheme. So by 1943, Anne began a campaign <coughs> to end Mother's Day. Because <laughs> it wasn't at all what she had hoped it would be. She had hoped that people would just, from their heart, write a, a letter or make their own card or message for their mom or do something special for their mom to recognize them. And it had just been commercialized to the point where it was no longer that anymore. Well, she spent every last penny that she had trying to end Mother's Day. <laughs> ended up poor. As a matter of fact, she ended up in a mental institution the final years of her life and uh, passed away in 1948. So that's the sad news about Mother's Day. <laughs> the biblical news about Mother's Day. <laughs> I, I just never know. <laughs> uh, the biblical news or the biblical uh, reason for Mother's Day is found in Ephesians 6, 2, the very first part, honor your father and mother. But I, I want to center today on honoring your mother. Mother's Day is about your mother. I'm pretty sure everybody in this room has a mother. I don't think I'm going out on a limb saying that. Well, believe it or not, I have a mother too. Uh, this is my mom. Her name was Irene Bittner at the time. She was going to school at a small Bible college known as Milwaukee Bible Institute. And that was part of the ministry of Fundamental Bible Church. And if you know anything about the history of Grace Bible Church... That's us. This was back on State Street, and she was a student from about 1948 to 1950. And this is her. I don't know exactly what she's doing in this photo, but uh, this is pre-mom here. But it, it's, it's my mom. This is a picture of her in 1940 or 1958. You will notice the building in the background. While my mom was going to school at Milwaukee Bible Institute, she made the decision that she wanted to be a pastor's wife and raise a family as a pastor's family. So they were married in 1950, and my dad took this church in Robinson Township, which is just outside of Grand Haven, Michigan. You're looking at the church. They didn't have enough money to finish the building, so they built a basement and put a flat roof over it, and that was beginning in about 1950. This is 1958, it's still a, bas a, a basement. If you look real close at the picture in the car, you'll see three little heads in there. That would be, <laughs> be my brother Tim, my sister Bonnie, and me, I think I'm the one up with my head up high there trying to figure out why dad was taking so long. But, you know, my mom really loved us kids, and she sacrificed a lot for us kids. In my dad's first ministry, and I say my dad, but it was literally my mom and dad's first ministry, they were given $25 a week as a pastor's salary. So that's, you know, Pastor Les and Linda can relate to that. And uh, just like them, I'm sure there were times when the church could not even afford that. Uh, my dad had to have a part-time job, but my mom always took care of us kids. There was a, a few years that we lived in a small uh, farm uh, worker's house across the street from the church. And the farm worker's house uh, had a bedroom, a living room, 
and a kitchen, no bathroom, no plumbing. And there was water that came into the house. Uh, there, there was an outhouse behind the house. Um, I can remember as a four-year-old, you know, having to wait my turn to take my bath in the kitchen sink, and the water had to be thrown out the window after you were done because there were no drains. Um, but my mom loved us and sacrificed, and, and the thing that impressed me the most about her was her desire to serve God, regardless of the cost. And she would do everything she could to make sure that her family made the best of it, even in the hard times. We're going to take a look at a number of mothers in the Bible. Uh, we're going to go through this somewhat quickly, but I want to point out the qualities of these women. We, we've heard these stories that I'll be presenting this morning many times, I'm sure, from Sunday school on up. But today I want to emphasize the mother in these stories. So the first one we're going to look at is a mother by the name of Jochebed. Um, by the way, moms, as you're thinking of names for your kids, this one hasn't been used for a while. It might be, <laughs> might be a good one. Before we look at the actual passage, I want to back up just a little bit and give you some um, background on Jochebed. Now, we, we're not given her name in the book of Exodus here. But in the book of Numbers, chapter 26, verse 59, it tells us that the name of Amram's wife was Jochebed, the daughter of a Levite who was born to Levi in Egypt. And she bore him uh, Aaron, Moses, and Miriam. By the way, Miriam, this, this is my second favorite Miriam because my favorite Miriam is sitting right back there. She is, yep, yep. So anyhow, there's another name for you if you're looking for names. Uh, Amram, that'd be a good boy's name. So looking at Exodus chapter 2, beginning with verse 1, um, they were from the house of Levi. Um, verse 2 says, The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. Now, why did she hide him? because the Pharaoh at this time was afraid that the population of the Jewish people was increasing so rapidly that he wanted to do a little population control. So if a boy was born, they were to throw the boy in the river as crocodile food, I'm sure. There was something within this woman that made her decide that she was willing to risk her life for this little guy. So she hid this baby, Moses, for three months. And verse 3 says, When she could no longer hide him, she took him and placed him in a basket made of bulrushes and dabbed with uh, pitch. And she placed the child in it and placed it among the reeds in the river. So at this point, I always kind of get a kick out of this because now she's actually obeying the Pharaoh's command to throw the child in the river. <laughs> it's just she made this handy little floating device for him, so he's going to be okay. And she had her daughter, Miriam, uh, stand a short distance off and watch and make sure that Moses was going to be okay in this basket. And we know the story how Pharaoh's daughter uh, came down to the river and saw this basket, sent out her uh, servants to get the basket and bring it back. And when she opened this basket and saw inside of it, it says, little baby boy, in verse 6 she says this, this is one of the Hebrew children, and she took pity on him. And then the sister uh, said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? So it's a nice little preemptive thing here because I'm not sure necessarily that Pharaoh's daughter had that thought to begin with. Um, so Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. So the girl went and called the child's mother, his real mother, obviously. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take the child away and nurse him for me. 
and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. And when the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. So from what we can see from this, she had time to instill the knowledge of God in this little Moses. And generally speaking, they would nurse a child until maybe the age of four, five, six. You know, it kind of varied in, in some of these cultures. So she had him during what we would call the formative years. And the impact she had on him just during those early years was enough that when, when he was 40 years old, he made a, a life-changing decision. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 24 through 26 tells us, that's Hebrews 11, 24 through 26, by faith Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of the Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God rather than enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. And the next verse is key. Because remember, she only had him for a few years. It says this, He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than all the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. So she instilled in this little guy a love for God and a desire to serve God regardless of the cost that lasted with him not only into his 40s, but for the rest of his life. Now we know Moses served God. Aaron, his brother, was the high priest. Miriam, his sister, was a prophetess. So Jochebed had a tremendous influence on bringing up her children. And it had an impact. She was a godly woman from what we can see. The next woman I want to take a look at is the woman Ruth. And Ruth kind of falls outside of the normal uh, um, godly women that we would think of because Ruth was not a Jewish woman. So in the book of Ruth, um, chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. And before we read those, let me set up the story for you. So it was during the time when judges ruled the land of Israel. And a man of Bethlehem in Judea sojourned to Moab with his wife and his two sons. So that's found in Ruth chapter 1, the very first verse. So they're from Bethlehem um, and of Judea, so they're from the tribe of Judah. So they go to Moab because of a famine that's going on. And there in Moab, the two boys marry uh, Moabitish women. Uh, her husband becomes ill. He passes away. The two boys pass away. And now Naomi is left with no husband, no children, and two Moabite women that are daughters-in-law. So she tells them, go home. You don't, don't need to come with me. I'm going back to, to Jerusalem or back to uh, Bethlehem, or back to Israel. So she says, you, you stay here. So the one woman goes back to her family. But Ruth, verse 16 of chapter 1 says, Ruth, a Moabite woman, said, don't urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people. And your God will be my God. And where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more. If anything but death parts me from you. And Naomi saw that she was determined. <laughs> Yes, I would say. So they returned to Jerusalem, and it is the barley harvest. When they return to Jerusalem, Naomi is older, but Ruth has still got plenty of energy, and, and she's very concerned about her mother-in-law. 
So she goes out and begins gleaning in the fields, which is what you were supposed to do if you had nothing. And Boaz sees Ruth and decides that this is kind of a special woman. Yes, she's from Moab, but she loves Naomi. She has sacrificed much for Naomi. She's out there working her little fingers to the bone for Naomi. And he realized that this was a very special woman. So he says in chapter 2, verse 11, uh, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of her husband has been fully told to me and how you left your father and your mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have taken refuge. So she came not just because of Naomi, but she came because she wanted to follow the Lord God. This Moabite woman was a godly woman by the time they're back in Bethlehem. And as we know, Boaz was actually a kinsman redeemer and he marries Ruth and let's look at our passage now, chapter four, verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, or the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a redeemer. And here again is that kinsman redeemer. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life, a nourisher of your old age, and your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons has given birth to him. So Naomi took the child then and laid him on her lap and she became his dry nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, who was the father of David. Now, Ruth was an exceptional woman. Ruth loved God. Ruth wanted to follow God. She loved and sacrificed, just as a mother does, even for her own mother-in-law. So she's a perfect example of the love of a mother. But to have a child and turn that child over to your mother-in-law to us seems like a rather strange thing. But the family name and all the inheritance would have died out had she not done that. So once again, she was thinking of her mother-in-law. Now, it was still her child. And in the lineage of Christ, we see that Ruth is named as one of the descendants in the lineage of Christ. So Obed was the son. He was the father of Jesse, who was the father of David. And we see how David loved God, and we see the, the scope of his spiritual life, and we know that that just didn't happen on its own. He had to see this as an example from his parents, his grandparents, and Ruth would have been his great-grandmother. So he would have seen that godliness in this Moabite woman who gave herself unselfishly to her mother-in-law and to serve God. The next mother I want to look at is the mother Hannah. And I did spell it right on the slide. Hannah, 1 Samuel 2, verses 19 through 21. And again, I'm going to set this up before we actually get to the passage. So Hannah was not able to have children. 
And in 1 Samuel 1.10, it says this, she was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she prayed to God, and she's in the temple at this time. She's praying to God, and, and she vowed a vow, and she said to the Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look at my affliction, because again, she's childless, the affliction of your servant, and remember me, and forget me not, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. And she continued praying to the Lord, and Eli observed this, and of course we know Eli saw her lips moving and didn't hear anything, and she, he figured she was drunk, but she wasn't drunk, and she explained to him, you know, I'm just in great distress because I want a child so bad. And he said, well, God grant it to you then. So she went home and conceived. And chapter 1, verse 22 says, Hannah did not go back to the temple again for a number of years with her husband and said, as soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him so he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. So Hannah, again, kept her son, who we know as Samuel, for a number of years until he was weaned. So again, probably four, five, six, somewhere in that range, before she brought him to the temple. And again, this seems like a really strange thing for a woman to, who had wanted a child so drastically to turn around and give that child back to the Lord. But she viewed it as just that, giving it back to the Lord. The Lord gave her the child, so she was going to let that child serve the Lord all the days of his life. And as we know, Samuel is one of the most noted prophets of the Old Testament. Samuel is the one that got to name the first two kings of Israel and anoint them as kings. He was a true servant of God, and, and, and I don't think he got that from being around Eli, the high priest. He had to have gotten that from his mother, a godly woman who was willing to sacrifice. So looking then at our passage, I'm going to take it back to verse 18. Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy clothed with a linen ephod. And his mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. And then Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, May the Lord give you children by this woman for the petition she has asked of the Lord. And they returned home. And the next verse is kind of cool. It starts out, Indeed. Yes, indeed the Lord visited Hannah, and she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters. And the boy Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. So, Hannah was an amazing woman. She was a godly woman. She wanted her son to be the servant of God, just like she was. We're going to move to the New Testament and take a look at two women in the New Testament. The first one is Eunice. And now there's a great name. <laughs> I believe we might have one of those in this uh, auditorium, if I'm not mistaken. Or Yes. Second Timothy chapter 1, and I think your notes, I accidentally put down <laughs> verse 15, but it's not, it's verse 5, so scratch the 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. And it says this. Now the Apostle Paul is um, speaking to Timothy here, and he says, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure it lives in you as well. So Timothy, a young Jewish boy, 
is raised by a godly mother and a godly grandmother. And in the book of Acts, chapter 16, verses 1 through 3, it says that uh, there was a young man there, Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. But he was well spoken of by those in Lystra and Iconium. And Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him on his missionary journey and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, uh, for he knew his father was a Greek. So it's interesting that he was well spoken of. Timothy stood above uh, the other kids at that point. He was a godly young man because his mother and his grandmother were godly young or godly women. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15 gives us one more glimpse at Timothy's upraising. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15 says this, And how from a child you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which were able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. So he was taught from a child the Holy Scriptures. His grandmother and his mother instilled the word of God in his life. And it had an impact on him to the point where he could be the assistant of the Apostle Paul and put his life on the line to get the gospel of Jesus Christ out. Timothy was an exceptional young man because he had an exceptional mother and grandmother. Well, the last person I want to look at may seem like a an unusual one for Mother's Day because Anna was childless. But I think Anna exemplifies the qualities of a mother even though she did not have children, she exemplifies the qualities that are found in a mother. Sacrifice and a desire to serve and please. Luke chapter 2 verses 36 through 38. And before we go there, um, if you look back a little bit further to verse 29, you'll see that this is 40 days after Jesus Christ has been born. He was circumcised on the eighth day, and on the 40th day, he had to be brought to the temple in Jerusalem, and two turtle doves had to be given as a sacrifice of purification for his mother, Mary. And as they go there for this sacrifice, he's also going to be inspected by the priests to make sure that the circumcision was done properly. And Simeon is there, and God had told Simeon that he would not die until he saw the Savior, the Redeemer. He would not die until he saw them. So verse 29 tells us that Simeon said, Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for a glory to your people, Israel. So Anna is standing there listening to this. Now what was Anna doing in the temple this hour of the day? Well, verse 36 through 38 give us a glimpse at Anna. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phineel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from her virginity, and then as a widow until she was 84 years old. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. So even though this woman did not have a child, she was giving of herself to God 
just as she just as she would give herself to raising a child she was putting that same amount of effort into serving God and worshiping God fasting and praying and worshiping day and night now she did not live at the temple she still would have had some place to live but she would have spent every waking hour in that temple day and night and God gave her the gift of seeing Christ. Forty days old, and she became a witness. She became an evangelist that the Savior was born, the redemption was born. That is a special gift. Now, I know Mother's Day, there's so many emotions that can come and go during Mother's Day because let's face it, not everybody has had a good experience with their mother. Uh, some of you have had wonderful experiences with your mothers and have lost your mothers. Um, I was able to be with my mom her final Mother's Day just two years ago and to spend just a, a really special time together just a, a couple months before she passed away. Um, yeah, I miss my mom. And I know there are a lot of you that miss your moms too. A lot of you still have moms. And I want to encourage you today to thank your mom. I want to encourage you to do something special for your mom. If, you, if your mom is already gone, thank God for the mom that you had. If you are a mom, let me encourage you today. Be the mom that God wants you to be. You know, being a mom doesn't make you a special person. It brings out what you already are. If you are a generous person before you've had children, you're going to be a generous person after you've had a child. It doesn't make you a better person, but it, it lets you realize <laughs> maybe sometimes what we need to work on I know as a father, that is definitely the truth. Uh, yeah, it's, but as a mother, God has gifted women with a, a comprehension and an ability and a heart. Just like the video that we watched at the beginning of the service this morning, uh, guys don't get it. <laughs> we, we just... And not, not all guys. Some guys are much more sensitive than others. But, you know, guys, we need to understand and appreciate our moms and our wives and our daughters that are moms. We need to understand and appreciate and encourage them because they have a tough job. And as far as I'm concerned, I think being a mom is probably the most important job on the planet. <laughs> Let's close in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for mothers. And we thank you that when you were trying to explain your love and your concern and your sacrifice, the, the best example you could use was that of a mother. Father, we don't understand how you can just have so many qualities that, um, that are just almost humanly impossible to explain, and yet your love, your sacrifice, your concern, your care, Father, it's an amazing thing to see that that is your quality. We pray that you would help the mothers to live the qualities that you have. Give them the strength, give them the patience, Give them the desire to be instruments in your hand to raise up the next generation of people that will love and serve you. And Father, for those of us that have lost our mothers, I want to thank you for the mother that was able to raise me and um, give her love to me. Um, I pray that you would bless many others with the mothers that they have had as well. And for those that are our wives, Father, help us as husbands to be thankful and appreciative and encouraging to them as well. Give us a special day now as we remember mothers. In our Savior's name, amen.